Okay, um, let's get started. I think I finally got figured out. Oh, one more coming in. I think I finally got this I'm machine sorry, figured out, so it's not going to give me trouble. Uh, it's giving me trouble. Up oh, there it is. Okay. Tonight, um, I think as you all know, I'm Wally Moran, and um, I do the Sail to the Sun ICW rally. Uh, I've done about 50 trips. I lost count now on the ICW, uh, and for years I've been making it a point of observing the ICW, um, observing changes, talking to people about uh, the best practices for doing the ICW, things like that. And every year that I, I do this ICW seminar or webinar, it changes uh, to update to current conditions. Um, last week, we talked about some of the, um, excuse me, some of the um, apps that can be done and, and a few of the uh, issues that are important to know about in the ICW. Tonight, we're going to talk about some of the destinations, anchorages, and cities uh, that you can get to. And if you have any locations that I don't touch on that you're curious about, feel free to ask. Um, that's what I'm here for is to answer your questions because there's no way I can come up with uh, all the answers to, uh, to a million and one questions. Okay, coming down the ICW, the first major community that you'll come to is Beaufort, North Carolina. And that is Beaufort, North Carolina, as opposed to Beaufort, North, South Carolina. Um, and if you, especially in Beaufort, South Carolina, if you say it wrong, they will correct you. Anyway, um, Beaufort is one of my favorite stops on the IC. Actually, they're all my favorite stops. So I, I shouldn't lie about that. Um, th but everyone is a little bit different. Some of the nice things about Beaufort or Beaufort, North Carolina, pardon me. It's got a gorgeous downtown and a gorgeous boardwalk. It's one of the nicest, um, downtown waterfronts along the entire East coast. Lots of great pubs, uh, a number of good restaurants. Now, the highlight for me in Beaufort is the Maritime Museum and the Wooden Boat Museum. Uh, I've probably gone to the Maritime Museum 10 or 15, at least 10 or 15 times. And every trip, it's interesting. They have new exhibits, uh, new stuff to see. They have excellent lectures. Uh, we, I usually bring the rally in for a, a session there, uh, and they'll put on a lecture for the uh, rally. Beaufort, of course, is where... Um, Edward Teach, uh, Blackbeard was captured. And um, they have an excellent section on, on Blackbeard if you're interested in pirates. Uh, there's a good anchorage there, although it can be very, very crowded. And there's a dinghy dock as well. Um, so if you want to anchor up rather than take a, take a marina slip, it's perfectly possible to do that. Um, when you're coming in, when you're coming from the north, I'm not sure whether my arrow, my cursor can be seen on this um, on this um, screen or not. But as you're coming down, you come to a division, and you can either follow the ICW all the way through, or alternatively, you can cut off and take the Russell Slough, which is a little bit shorter. So you come down to this point. If you take the Russell Slough, you come down. There used to be a drawbridge in there. They've removed the drawbridge and put a highway bridge in now, so it's very, very easy to come through. As you come through and you get into the downtown area, make sure that you hug the right-hand side, the starboard side of the channel, as there is a shoal there that, especially at low tide, is going to catch even uh, shallow draft boats unaware. As you come around, you swing into the um, into the uh, downtown area, into the, the um, anchoring area. You'll see anchoring off to your starboard side. The marina is off to your left. Typically, there's one, if not two, really big. And when I say really big, I'm talking 100 foot plus sailboats there that are always a, always fun to watch. Um, there's a lot of current there. Um, if you anchor out, uh, you'll be right off of the beach where you can actually see ho uh, wild horses uh, on a regular basis. Okay. Um, so that's Beaufort for the moment. Let's move on to our next. Okay. Oh, lovely. There we go. Okay. That's the one I wanted. As you, there's the anchorage. Whoops, there we go. There is the anchorage uh, noted. Um, it uh, shallows out as you get closer to the, to the uh, island there. When you're leaving, you do not have to go the same route. Instead, as you come to where you turned in off of Russell Slough, turn to, turn to port this time and follow the route out, it will take you all the way out. When you come out, it's not shown in this chart, but when you come out, go all the way past the very last marker, especially if the current is, is inbound, if you've got a flood tide, because it will push you back onto the um, the small shoal that is there. 
So swing out, get yourself nice and wide around there, and then head off again, uh, heading south in the ICW. Okay, Swansboro, North Carolina. I'm actually going to be there tomorrow. Um, it has become one of my a favorite stop of mine. It's a small town, a small city, I guess you could call it. Um, but it's really quite pleasant, quite nice. Um, you can anchor out there, or they have a city dock, which is fairly inexpensive. There's a very strong current, but even if you're anchored, the holding is quite good, and you shouldn't have to worry about it. Um, just make sure, of course, that you have the appropriate uh, scope out and, and probably a little bit extra. There is a shoal there on entering that you want to watch out for, and there's a shoal a little bit further in, so you want to anchor far enough back. Um, the city dock, um, when you get there, you'll find a phone number. Call them, and the dock master will come down, or you can walk a couple of blocks up, and you can sign into the um, to the um, the the uh, dockage at the uh, Chamber of Commerce office. This used to be a free dock. It's now, um, I'm going to say, I want to say it's a buck 50 a foot. I can't recall offhand. There is power and there is water. The one thing to remember is that when you're coming into this dock, there is a huge current. So you're going to have to use your very best docking skills to come in here. Uh, if you have a bigger boat over 40 feet, they will typically uh, get you on the face dock, which makes docking a little bit easier. Um, Okay, I mentioned there's a couple of restaurants and a pub that are right outside the dock. There are some excellent restaurants in town. There's entertainment on most weekends, and it's really a fun spot to hang out. There's a grocery store, a hardware store, and so forth within reasonable distance. Uh, you could walk if you wanted to, or you could grab an Uber. There is Uber available. Okay, so that's Swansboro. Now, if you don't want to run all the way down to Wrightsville Beach in one shot, you can run to a place called Mile Hammock, which is on the Camp Lejeune uh, Marine Base. It's a very, very large anchorage, well protected, and it has very good holding. Uh, oftentimes, you'll get military activity going on there, and that can be quite exciting for those of us who haven't been part of the military. You'll get um, vertical takeoff and landing airplanes going by, lots of thumping. Uh, occasionally, there's live fire, so it gets pretty loud. Um, you'll have jets going over. You'll have... Um, uh, the Marines come flying by in uh, in their inflatable boat. It's um, it, it can really get quite thrilling and entertaining, but sometimes it goes on late into the night, 11, 11, 30, 12 o'clock, and, and it makes sleeping a bit of a challenge. But uh, it's part of it's that's only happened once uh, in the times I've been there, and I've been there 40, 45 times, I guess, so quite a few times. Uh, going ashore if you have a dog is not permitted, but it's also not enforced, and there's a large there's a large dock there that uh, you can come up beside and tie off or drag your dinghy up onto the ramp. If you walk far enough up, by the way, you'll come up to something that you won't see in too many places. There's a big sign saying tank crossing, and that's not something you see everywhere. Okay, um, if you look at the, um, at the, um, the chart, hang on, I'm, I'm going to get rid of that. There, that's better. Now I can see my entire screen. Uh, as you, as you, as you're coming down, uh, you want to stay a bit to the right of center uh, at that one the one curve just before you come to Mile Hammock. It does shallow out a little bit, and that may have changed this year. The they had some really significant rainfall uh, in uh, the in the no name storm uh, just a couple of days ago, something like twenty two inches of rain. So it may have changed uh, what is happening at this inlet here. And this inlet didn't exist a few years ago. It was actually created by one of the uh, the hurricanes about, I want to say, four or five years ago. So keep that in mind. Things may have changed with the weather if you're coming down this year. Okay, moving on to our next one. New River Inlet is a few miles past Camp uh, Camp Lejeune and the Mile Hammock Anchorage. This has changed. This changes regularly. Now this is the most recent track for going through Mile Hammock or uh, New River Inlet. Pardon me. It has changed from what it was a year ago, and with the weather of a few days ago, it may have changed again. Obviously, I'm going to find out tomorrow, and I'll, I'll be able to update anybody who wants to know. But currently, <clears throat> currently, whoops, that's not what I wanted to happen. There we go. Uh, currently, what happens, you come down, swing in close to the, the point that is on the northern end, and you're going to feel like it's way too close. Don't panic. You'll see anywhere from 10 to 14 feet of water at low tide under your keel. So you'll be you'll be safe. Um, 
once you come through, you come into, into deep water, swing out towards the red, and then just follow the, the water through. Now, <clears throat> something I want to mention, a lot of you are familiar with Bob 423, and I'm going to be discussing that next week. Don't stare at your chart plotter when you're going through tricky areas like this. Never stare at your chart plotter, okay? The chart plotter can be wrong, and, and that's an issue. What you do is you take a look at the proposed path you want, you mark where you want to go, and then you keep your eye on the depth sounder and on the on the water surrounding you as you go through. So anyway, uh, the current coming through here again is very powerful. Um, one of the tricks you want to learn to not be swept out of the channel is as you're coming through, look behind yourself and make sure that you're on the same track that you've not been pushed sideways. Because what happens as we're driving forward, you'll be you'll be adjusting. The, the bow of your boat in the direction you want to go and you may have to be being pushed sideways you may be crabbing out so what you want to do is check behind you and make sure you've not been pushed out of the channel um okay now right still beach which is where i am right now uh the bridge here is on the hour okay so you want to make sure especially in the fall that you get there no later than four o'clock because the sun of course in november is setting around five o'clock you don't want to have to be coming into a a brand new anchorage you've never been to in the dark. <clears throat> it is a large anchorage, although you'll find lots of small local boats. Um, today, for the first time ever, I'm in the anchorage entirely on my own. There's not a single boat anywhere near me. There's a dinghy dock in the northeast corner by the bridge. So when you come into the anchorage, and again, I'm, where's my cursor here? Okay, up here in this corner by the small bridge, there's a dinghy dock, um, room for several boats. Uh, there's easy access to several several of the local pubs. There's a pizza shop, an ice cream shop, and you can walk to the beach if you want. There's several several marinas available for fuel. Uh, if you want dockage in this area, you really do need to call at least several days in advance, particularly during the season. And the reason for that is because all these marinas here are full of local boats. Now, <clears throat> at the north entrance, which is this entrance right up here where the arrow is, there is some significant shoaling. I went through it today and I went through on the shallow side right at low tide to see what I could find. And I found, <clears throat> excuse me, I found about six feet of water. However, the, and again, I'll, I'm gonna be getting into this next week. The uh, hydrographic chart provided by the US Army Corps of Engineers is not accurate. The deep water is actually where, where it shows the shallow water to be. Um, so, so as I said, these things change all the time and you really have to in places like this call ahead for local information or check online for somebody who has been there in the past short while to make sure that you don't get caught. Or of course, go through at something other than, than low tide. Um, my timing was lousy today and that's my fault, but because I know the inlet, I wasn't particularly worried about it. Um, where are we? Now, if you wanna go offshore between Beaufort and, um, and Wrightsville Beach, you can, go, <coughs> you can go offshore using Masonboro Inlet, which is right here. This is a deep inlet. You just come straight out past the jetties and then turn north uh, if you're headed for Beaufort or you come in and say offshore far enough to miss the jetties and then just come straight in lots of depth. When you get inside there, just hang a right and you can anchor anywhere along that way. Okay. The other nice thing about Brightsville Beach it is a great place to reprovision. Uh, if you uh, fuel up at Sea Path Marina, uh, they often, I don't know if they still do it, but I didn't ask today and I should have, um, they often will permit the use of their loaner car for you to get up to the uh, the local um, uh, Publix or Winn-Dixie or Walmart, which is only a couple of miles away. And of course, you can always grab an Uber from the park by the dinghy dock. Okay, Snow's Cut now and the Cape Fear River. When you are coming out of Wrightsville Beach and you get down to Carolina Beach and you turn into what's called Snow's Cut. Now, the current in Snow's Cut is dictated by whatever current is coming through Carolina Beach Inlet, which is just a little to the north of where that chart is right here. So in other words, the current in Carolina Beach Inlet is going to be different, the reverse of what it is on the Cape Fear River. And it will switch roughly at this point here at the end of the snow's cut. So you could be zooming along through here doing seven and a half knots, and then you'll hit the change in current and suddenly be doing four and a half knots or vice versa, depending on which way the current is going. What you want is to go into snow's cut with the current against you because what you want to have happening is you want to have the current with you coming down the cape fear river it's a ferocious current 
Uh, it was even worse yesterday because of all the rain that they've had. Uh, and I made the mistake of timing, <laughs> my own mistake. I made the mistake of timing it wrong. So I had to come most, I had to come part of the way up against a really strong current. Uh, I decided that I, that I had a good excuse to pull into a marina and get fuel. And I killed about an hour and a half there until the current changed and then was able to make much better time. Now, Cape Fear is a big ship inlet. When you get into the Cape Fear River, the markers will be reversed. Coming south, typically the reds are on your right-hand side. Once you get into the Cape Fear River channel, the markers will be, the reds will be on your left, okay, not on your right. And that'll, that'll be obvious once you get there, you look at your chart and you see where you're located. But in all of these big ship channels, um, Cape Fear is one, uh, Winya Bay is another, the, 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 the mark is reversed from what you're used to on the ICW. And they do that because they're paying attention to the big ship traffic in those locations. Okay, what you wanna do when you get into the Cape Fear, because it is large and it is a lot of current, review your course the, fall, the, the night before. Uh, maybe put a couple of waypoints on your charter or on your chart plotter, pardon me. And the reason you want to do that, of course, is so that you've got a waypoint to aim for so you don't get lost. Although it's it's fairly obvious once you get there, you're probably not going to have a problem. But if you want to be sure of yourself, a couple of waypoints so you know where you're headed for will help. Um, you want to be sure that you watch out for freighters coming up. When you're in a big ship channel like the Cape Fear River, don't run down the center of it. Go over to the red side, go over to the green side. You're still going to have at least 40 feet of water and run down the edges where you're well out of the way of these big ships. Uh, there are several ferries that come back and forth across, so be watching for them. Try not to interfere with them. Anyway, it's it's easy if you plan ahead, and like everything else, that means sitting down with your charts the night before and taking a look and, and realizing that what you see in the chart is not going to look, what you see is not going to look like what you thought you saw in the chart. So take the time to study a little bit, make it easy on yourself. Well, that's interesting. What do we do there? Oh, okay. Um, this is uh, from the um, Tide Pro app. And what this is, this is the current page. So you're wondering to yourself, how can I find what the current's gonna be so I get an easy run down the Cape Fear River? Go to your Tide app and click on the Sunny Point Army Base or one of the the um, tide, tidal, um, uh, tide uh, gauges that's on the Cape Fear River. Click on the currents for the day you're going, and then click to the day you're going through, and it will tell you, okay? In this case, the ebb tide is uh, highest at 12.18 in the morning, so just after midnight, it goes slack at 2.30, maximum flow is at 6 o'clock, and then slack is at 9.30 a.m., 9.36 a.m. So what you want to do, if you're coming from Wrightsville Beach, if I was coming from Wrightsville Beach with that scenario right there, I'd leave Wrightsville Beach at 8.30, 9 o'clock, call it. Uh, that would give me about a two-hour run to get to the snow's, snow's Cut. From there, I would run through Snow's Cut. There we go. I would run through Snow's Cut, and I would then have the ebb tide on the Cape Fear River that would bring me down Cape Fear quite a bit faster than than what it would otherwise. Um, I think the fastest I've seen anybody go down the Cape Fear River uh, under sail when they've had the tide with them was uh, 12 and a half or 13 knots. So it, it's really a rocking current. Uh, it's also great fun when you can go that fast in your boat, on a sailboat. Okay, on to our next one. Southport. Um, some of you have probably heard about the recent uh, no-name storm that we had. I was in Southport for the no-name storm and I'm quite glad I was. I, I was actually going to leave the following morning, uh, check my weather and the weather forecast, uh, the uh, nhc.noaa.gov, which is the hurricane page, uh, indicated that there was a change in the weather that they were anticipating that the no-name storm could become a named storm or worse. So I thought to myself, you know, I like Southport. I'm tied up right beside a restaurant. I'm going to hang out for a couple of days. Uh, the restaurant I was tied up beside offers free overnight dockage if you're dining or if you're going in for a couple of beer. Uh, this time of year, of course, it's it was pretty much vacant. There was nobody else um, on the docks. Um, but it, it's it's a free dock. There are no uh, no services. Uh, there's no electricity. There's no power. But if you're looking for a free dock, there it is. Um, in the anchorage itself, there's room for one or maybe two boats. Um, now, when you leave Southport, uh, if you want to avoid Shallots Inlet and Lockwood's Folly Inlet, 
you can go offshore from Little River Inlet to, or from Southport to Little River Inlet. It's 26 nautical miles. The key to that, let's see if I've got the chart for that one. Hopefully I do. Hello. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Okay, we're gonna go back one. Okay. Um, if you're going offshore to Little River Inlet, when you come out of uh, Southport, when you come out of the inlet, there is a what they call a swash channel. This is what the channel the locals use. It comes in quite close to the point on the south side of the inlet. But if you pay attention, you'll see a minimum of eight feet all the way uh, going through. Just follow that eight foot line until it becomes 10, 11, and then gets back into somewhat deeper water. The alternative is running all the way out to the channel about two or three miles until you can get around the shoals that are a little further down. It's obvious on the chart um, and the locals use it all the time. Okay, where are we? Hello. There we go. Okay, now leaving Southport, there are two inlets that have been problems for years and years and years. Lockwood's in Lockwood's Folly rather than Shallots. And Lockwood's Folly is called that, from what I understand, because the um, it was named after a guy who built himself a boat further up the river from, from the inlet. Uh, and unfortunately, he built the boat too deep to traverse the inlet, and so it never, ever got offshore. Anyhow, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the general rule for going through Lockwood's Folly is to stay 30 to 50 feet off of the reds to the deepest water. Now, for an up-to-date route, I often suggest that you can check with Bob 423 Chacks. Currently, Bob has, in fact, was the subject of a discussion between Bob and I the other day. Bob has altered his tracks to have you go outside of the marked channel. I do not ever recommend anybody go outside the marked channel. What you should do is time your passage through Lockwood's Folly, through Shallots Inlet, so you have got at least two feet of water additional underneath you. In other words, don't go right at low tide, go an hour and a half, make sure that you hit Lockwood's Folly an hour and a half to two hours after low tide. You'll have more than adequate water. And if you should punch it into the mud, uh, the rising tide will help get you off. Don't ask me how I know that works, but <laughs> trust me, uh, it works. I found that out in Shallots Inlet. Now, okay, if you have any concerns about an inlet as you're coming through it, not just this one, but any inlet at all, contact either Seatow or Towboat on VHF Channel 16 and ask them for their local advice and what they what they want you to do on what they think you should do on that inlet. Um, and again, next week I'm going to get, be getting into more detail on passage planning and how to use things like hydrographic charts to make your trip easier. Okay, so Lockwoods, as I said, 30 to 50 feet off the reds for the deepest water, and also shallots, same routine. Chalice was in pretty good condition this time around. Lockwoods, I saw nothing under about seven feet, and that was within an hour of, of uh, low tide. Okay, and there's shallots. Same thing as you can see. Where it gets difficult in shallots is right up around this, is right rather down in this area here when you look at the, um, at the, uh, the hydrographic chart. Okay, now if you want to avoid all the fuss, I said, run offshore from the Cape Fear Inlet to the Little River Inlet. Um, what happens here is you come out, make sure that you avoid the shoaling that's right here, go right out to the sea buoy, which is not shown in this chart, and then come straight in. Now, most charts do not show the depths that are here. There's more than adequate depth. There's a, a couple of, um, small casino gambling boats that come through here and it's well marked. You'll have no trouble following it in. Don't worry about the fact that it may not show on your charts what's there. So from, from, uh, Southport. The Little River Inlet is 26 nautical miles. And if you catch the ebb leaving Southport, you'll, you should be able to catch the flood coming in at the Little River. It's a very, very easy deep water run. Um, if you're coming north, you can leave the anchorage at Little River and jump offshore from there. Now, when entering... Oh, pardon me. Okay, I'm, we're talking about the anchorage. There's an anchorage right here at Little River Inlet at, uh, where, where the, uh, the inlet crosses the ICW. I was anchored there just a couple of days ago. Always loved that spot. Got some good memories of hanging out there. Um, anyway, uh, sorry, I, I shouldn't be smiling here. I'm, I'm, I'm. You, you don't want to know. Anyway, um, 
as you come around, don't mix up the channel markers with the ICW marker. Pay attention to your chart. Take a look at the hydrographic if you, if you have them downloaded, and you'll see that you should have at least six to seven feet even at low tide coming through. Swing, raw, swing, raw, swing wide around the red marker as you make the turn, and you'll be able to anchor in eight to 12 feet of water. Now, this can be a rolly anchorage because there's a lot of fishing boats, both small fishing boats and, and commercial head boats coming out, uh, and they, throw, they can throw up quite a wake. That's really the only drawback of that anchorage. Uh, some cruisers will anchor on the inlet side of the ICW. Um, I'm not so keen on it because of the strong current and because there's even more traffic than on the other side. Well, it's up to you. And by the way, now you're in South Carolina. Remember, please, to turn your VHF from your, for bridges from Channel 9 to Channel 13. Oops, where are we? Okay. Um, okay, the offshore run from Southport. If you decide that you want to go offshore from Southport and avoid the ICW, um, Southport to the Little River Inlet, as I've mentioned, is 26 nautical miles. If you go all the way to Winya Bay, and that means if you go all the way to Winya Bay, you're going to be missing the um, the Waccamaw River, which is gorgeous. Uh, that's 70 nautical miles. And if you go Southport to Charleston, that's 115 nautical miles. So you can save a considerable amount of time by doing these runs. Um, it's up to you which way you want to do it. If you're comfortable with an offshore run. Uh, the best part of doing this offshore here, especially if you go to Winya Bay, is you avoid Myrtle Beach. And it's not that Myrtle Beach is bad or difficult for boating. I just don't like Myrtle Beach. Okay. So inshore through Myrtle Beach. Um, once you get through Myrtle Beach, there are a variety of anchorages in the Waccamaw River. You want to be sure that you tie a line to your anchor if you anchor in the Waccamaw because there's oftentimes um, uh, deadheads and that on the bottom that can hook your anchor. So tie a line to your anchor to retrieve it. <laughs> the nice thing about the Waccamaw is it's very, very deep, uh, but make sure that you follow your charts because some of the corners will shallow out quite a bit. The only good reason in my mind for going through, the, for going through Myrtle Beach is because you get to enjoy the Waccamaw River to Georgetown. Now, in the springtime, if you're returning back north, definitely, definitely do the Waccamaw River because it's absolutely gorgeous. You'll get porpoises. You'll see all kinds of turtles sunning on the rocks. Uh, you may see gators. It's really, really a beautiful trip in the spring. And that's my opinion of Myrtle Beach. Okay, Georgetown. Georgetown is truly a southern town. Uh, it's small enough to have retained its, its southern attitude, and it's big enough to have everything you need. The downtown is simply gorgeous. Uh, and again, another nice waterfront with a, um, a dock running all the way down the waterfront. Uh, there are several anchorage or several marinas. There's an anchorage. Uh, you have one, two, two dinghy docks. You can bring your big boat up to the dinghy dock for the day if you have to do shopping and you want to load directly onto that. Or you can bring your dinghy dock. The dinghy docks are not, however, for overnight, no overnight staying. Uh, but very, very convenient location for cruisers. Now, when you enter the harbor, watch for, after you cross the bifurcation buoy, which is the the um, the green, red, green, or red, green, red, I forget which one, which one it is, the red, green, red. When you cross that one, look ahead, and you're going to see a marina with a bunch of sport fish and, and a dock that looks like it's almost pointing straight at you. Point towards that dock, especially if you're in shallower water because that route is going to be your deep water route going in there. Now, the bakery by the clock tower has got absolutely fabulous baked goods. Please say hi for me, especially to the, the gal uh, who works at the, at the desk there. Her name is Brent. Um, unfortunately, she's engaged to be married, or I'd probably be living in Georgetown now. Anyhow, um, one of the events that's really a lot of fun there is the Seafood Festival. It's in November. I highly recommend it. Uh, all kinds of great seafood, uh, lots of oysters, uh, blue crab, you name it. A lot of fun. Uh, in October, if you're heading down early, uh, they have the Wooden Boat Show. I've not been able to catch the Wooden Boat Show, but I'm told it's a really, really good show. Take the time to walk around Georgetown. Lots of historic homes, lots of interesting places to look at and visit. I highly recommend it. If you need a chiropractor, there is an inexpensive chiropractor. The guy's actually a full-time high school teacher, but he's also a licensed chiropractor, and he set up an office. He does treatments after school hours and on Saturdays. 
Um, I found that out because I, a couple of years ago, I was coming into Georgetown and I put my back out and I was in some considerable pain. And every place I was checking for a chiropractor was 125 bucks a visit. And, and I knew I was in for at least eight or 10 visits before my back was going to be sorted out. And then somebody said, well, why did you call uh, Dr. Ed? And I said, well, who's Dr. Ed? And they, they clued me in. So I called him 25 bucks a visit. So instead of costing me 1200 bucks, it cost me 250. Um, one of the things to remember about Georgetown, local transportation out of the town is almost non-existent. Okay, there's no longer any bus. Uh, it's very rare that you catch an Uber. There is a local shuttle. Uh, you can get information on that in town, um, but make sure that you book it ahead of time. But basically it's like the, the Eagle song. You can check out, but you can never leave. And once you get to Georgetown, like a friend of mine who's there now, you may not want to leave. Um, on leaving when you're heading south, wait for about 60 to 90 minutes after the ebb starts at the uh, at the entrance to Winya Bay, um, at the entrance rather to the Sandpit River on, which is right at Winya Bay. Wait about 60 to 90 minutes. That will give you a great current. We'll just pull you right out Winya Bay and into the ICW and keep your speed up really, really nicely. Okay, otherwise it's like Cape Fear, it's just a, a really powerful river. Okay, Georgetown to Charleston. It's it's typically too much for a sailboat for a single day run. In all the times I've been doing this trip, I have only once ever managed to make the trip in one day from Georgetown to Charleston. And part of the reason for that is because the Ben Sawyer Bridge closes at 4 p.m., the Ben Sawyer Bridge in Charleston. If you miss that bridge, it doesn't open again until after six o'clock. It's now well into dark. And if you're new going south, you don't want to be in Charleston Harbor in the dark. It's confusing. Uh, it's, it's hard to know exactly where you are. So your best bet is to stop at one of the creeks like Whiteside Creek, which are a few miles before you come to Isle of Palms. Now there is shoaling at McClellanville, uh, but there are lots of places to anchor out if you cannot get through. And there's also a marina in McClellanville with a good seafood restaurant. Um, when you come into um, uh, McClellanville, this is McClellanville here off to the right. There is an anchorage here on Five Fathoms Creek, okay? It's an excellent anchorage, um, lots of um, lots of wildlife, por por uh, dolphins and such. Um, so you just come down, follow the mark channel, which the shrimpers use, and then turn to your port and, and anchor up in here. Uh, you can also, if you want, get offshore following the shrimpers channel all the way out through Five Fathom Creek. And if you wanted to go offshore from there to avoid McClellanville, you could then come around to Charleston that way. Where are we here? Okay, Georgetown to Charleston. Yes. Um, I've also noted some of the other anchorages that you can stop at. Um, these are a little bit further down. Um, and if you want to go as far as you can towards Charleston before you anchor out, around mile 451 is Whiteside Creek. And there are a number of, this is Whiteside Creek, in fact, right here, the bottom one. Just turn in, there's a bar here, then it drops down to about, let's say 20, 21 feet. And then it shallows out to about 12, 13, and runs up to anywhere 18 feet all the way around through and up to there. Uh, not a lot of wind coverage, but it's a good, strong anchorage uh, and really super pretty. Great sun, great sunsets here. Now, there's some significant shoaling at the Isle of Palm. Okay, and it's gotten worse since I created this, uh, this uh, graphic. Um, the shoaling is at Isle of Palms by 117A, and, the, and that's between the two bridges, the two highway bridges. Now, the current route that people are suggesting is you come in and you follow through this dog leg. Bob423 has got that listed. Um, and again, I don't ever recommend going off the channel, but it has been checked and shown. Now, the only time you're going to have to worry about that is at low tide. Anytime you're past a, an hour or so past low tide, there is going to be adequate water to just run straight through the, the uh, and stay on the ICW. As a general rule, as you pass the different inlets along here, here and here and, and back here, stay to starboard, stay to your, your, your right-hand side. And the reason for that is that usually on these things, the shoaling occurs on the inlet side, not on the land side. Now, the Ben Sawyer Bridge, as I've already mentioned, it closes at 4 p.m., so you want to make sure you watch your time. Now, Charleston, South Carolina. Love Charleston. 
My favorite marina in Charleston, South Carolina is the Charleston Maritime Center because it's close to everything. If you go out and you have one too many wobbly pops at the, the local pub, uh, it's within easy staggering distance. There is a, um, uh, a Harris Teeter grocery store just down the street. Everything's right there. Uh, the only problem with that marina is that it is quite rolling, okay? So if you do tie up there, make sure that you fender very, very well. Um, when you come out of the ICW, which on the right-hand side of the page, and you're crossing, put in a couple of waypoints to follow to make your life easier. Because once you get out there, it's broad, it's wide. You might have a couple of freighters to deal with. You'll definitely have some ferries to deal with. It can get real confusing real fast. So put yourself in a couple of, of um, waypoints that give you the run that I've just shown here, unless you go into the Charleston Maritime Center. And then you follow up following that red arrow, and that brings you to the turnoff to the ICW. Now, when you're leaving Charleston, keep in mind that the Wapu Creek Bridge, which is to the south, has got a, is closed from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning. So you, if you're leaving Charleston, you get to sleep in a little bit. Um, obviously, you're going to want to spend some time there. Great dining and lots of great entertainment. Um, oftentimes, in the past, I've anchored. It's not shown in this chart, but just past the Wapu Creek Bridge, on the um, on the left hand side, on the uh, t -t -t if you're going south, on the east side, had to think about that one. On the east side, there's a small grassy island. You can pull in there and you can anchor. The holding is very very good. Now it seems like it's not narrow enough, but the current is strong enough there that you won't go sideways into anything. The current will hold you in line with the the channel that's there, and that's again a lovely spot to anchor. If you need to go ashore, uh, you can go ashore at the restaurant by the bridge. You can go across to the other side. And you can go ashore at the um, at the dig at the uh, boat ramp there. Uh, one nice thing about this area there is a grocery store. There's a drug store. Uh, I think there might be a hardware store. I can't remember, but lots of facilities that are right nearby. Um, again, when you leave uh, when you leave Charleston and you're going down and you get under the Wapu Creek, Wapu Creek Bridge, your next cut is going to be called Fields Cut. It's only about a quarter mile long, but there is a huge current there. It just comes screaming through there. Uh, I've actually gone through there with the current against me and done 1.7 knots. Uh, unfortunately, it was only a quarter of a mile. Uh, the odd time I've seen people with underpowered boats who've actually had to wait until the current changed so they could get through on slack water. Just keep that in mind as you go through, especially if your boat's underpowered. And again, as you can see, your Tide Times Pro gives you the, the current for fields cut. When it's the slack, when it's the flow, um, you want to be going through on the flow, not the slack. Or sorry, you want to be going through on the on the ebb, not the flow. You want to be going through on the ebb. Wait a minute. You know what? I'm going to have to check that. But I believe you want to be going through on the flow. I apologize. You want to be going through on the flow because that that uh, cut is controlled by the current coming through the uh, Charleston Harbor. Okay. Moving on to our next spot. Charleston to Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, there are several anchorage, anchorages on the way to Beaufort. Again, you can do it in one run, but that, it makes for a long day. Uh, and if the currents are against you, it's going to be a struggle. Probably best to anchor out <clears throat> overnight. One of the best places to anchor out is Steamboat Landing. Um, so you come to uh, Daho um, Creek, but instead of turning to your right up Daho, you just go another a little further, about 0.9 miles further, turn to starboard and follow the creek in. And there's an excellent anchorage right by the boat ramp. Uh, if you have a dog or if you want to go for a walk, you can you can get ashore at the dinghy dock or the dock at the boat ramp uh, and enjoy that there. Really calm, peaceful spot. Really, really like it. Now, south of here, you start to experience some shoaling. However, the shoal areas that were to the south from Statute Mile 501 at the Highway Bridge the Statute Mile 504 at Green Marker 143 have been dredged as of a year ago, uh, and they are, even at low tide now, they are no problem, okay? The Ashbu Kusa cutoff has also been dredged to 11 feet in low water. Oops. Got a late arrival there. Okay. Um, so basically, even at low tide, you're not going to have significant difficult difficulties on this route any longer as you would have a couple of years ago. Now, if you want to, and it's getting close to low tide and you want to avoid any problems, you can take the Ashapa, 
Ashapu Kusak, which brings you a little further east and then takes you out and puts you back in the ICW. It takes you out of your route by about, uh, I think, eight or nine miles, if I remember correctly. Uh, I've never felt the need to use it, even um, even when the uh, the before the shoaling was done, because I make a point of going through it half tide rising. Okay, <clears throat> that's it for now. Unless we have any questions, uh, that went a little quicker than I anticipated. For those who uh, only just arrived, this um, this uh, session has been recorded and it will be online later tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, just take a look at Facebook Sailing and Cruising. Okay. Uh, for the link. Next week is going to be an important session. I'm going to be discussing passage planning in some detail. I'm going to be talking about my concept of half tide rising as being the way to successfully do the ICW and not go aground. I'll be discussing tides. I'll be discussing currents and how to plan your day and when it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Bob 423 tracks, uh, the good of them, the bad of them, and the problems that can be created by them. And I'll also be taking a look at the United States Army Corps of Engineers hydrographic charts, which if you don't have them, you should have them. And basically next week's session will be all about how not to screw up going south. Uh, and trust me, I've screwed up enough times. I think I know some of the answers here. Anyhow, do we have any questions, folks? Hey, hey Wally, this is uh, Julie Servilla. I have, a, I have some questions. First of all, thank you very much. This is uh, really great information. Um, Two questions. One is, will you, will you share this presentation with us? Yes, uh, it will be available uh, online, and uh, I will be sharing it with the Sail of the Sun people as well. Yes. Oh, perfect. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to be part of that Sail to the Sun. Um, Who is this? I see Jim, but... Uh, Julie, I'm his wife. Okay. Oh, uh, <laughs> now, I know, now I know who it is. Sorry. I just okay. saw, the, saw the, the name Jim, and I thought, okay, Jim who? Jim, anyway. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Jim and Julie. And yep. um, secondly, you know, when you're talking about marinas, is it a first come first serve situation? Or do we have to call ahead if once we know our schedule and we know like when we're where we're going to be? For the rally, I do all the I do everything pre booked. Uh, I call ahead to the marinas because this time of year is really, really busy. Uh, if, if for the rally with, you know, eight, 10, 12 boats, uh, I can't call them the day before and get space for that. They'll just be too busy. Mm -hmm. So I book ahead and I've been doing that for 10 years now. If you're a single boat coming south, I suggest that you call at least a day in advance and let them know when you expect to arrive there, if not two or three days in advance. One of the problems, and this is becoming a significant problem, is if is with the marinas that are using Dockwa uh, and snag a slip and things like that. If you call two or three or four days in advance, and, and book a slip. Let's say, what's today? Today's Wednesday. Let's say you call ahead and you book for Saturday. Let's say you've got a problem. Let's say the weather goes sideways or something. You're on the hook for that. You're on the hook for that marina. You're on the hook for the money. Uh, and you make a couple of mistakes like that. It starts to get expensive, which is one of the reasons I really despise these um, these um, marina, marina uh, booking services. Um, I fight with them all the time because they, they don't work very well for rallies. Um, but in any event, uh, when you're coming south, you should try try booking at, at a minimum a day ahead. Now, very there are very, very few places in the ICW if you miss uh, a marina, if you miss like getting a slip in a marina, there are very, very few places where there is not an anchorage of some kind available, Al although it may not be convenient. Uh, and if you have a dog, it may not be dog friendly. But again, those are things that we can discuss and I can give you answers for them on a specific basis. Um, and I'm always open to, to uh, questions. If somebody wants to send me a question on Messenger uh, or ask a question on, on sailing and cruising on Facebook, uh, I or somebody else is available and can give you an answer for that. So, so don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, I, have a quick, I have a quick question. Um, I, I despise DACWA and these things too, but my experience, at least um, uh, off the coast, has been it's a 15% penalty, not the total cost on the icw it's the entire booking um i've heard both i think to a certain extent it depends on the marina okay but i have heard of people getting stiffed for the entire dockage fee which, okay sitting if you got a 40 foot boat that's 100 bucks now well and plus it's ridiculous as you say you don't know for sure you're going to be someplace in a day well here's the here's the fun part okay and this this has happened 
everybody, what happens on the ICW is everybody sorts of moves en masse. So you have a clump of voters at this location. And ahead of them and behind them is another clump of voters in, the, in, the, the, in those locations. Everybody's sort of moving in step, okay? So what happens is, let's say you have a storm like we just had um, here right. in, uh, in, in South Carolina and North Carolina at the border area. Right. The North storm, okay? Everybody basically shut down for three days. Now, if you have a booking, at, let's say that I had a booking, um, where am I here? I have to think about where I am. Let's say I had a booking in Wrightsville Beach if, if they have a dock well facility here. And let's say that because of the storm, I could not make it. But I guarantee you that if they are full up, those boats that are here during that storm, they didn't move. So they still right. get paid. Only now they're not only getting paid right. for those boats, they're getting paid for your boat and you're not there. Yeah, and they're I, getting double. Yep. See, this is the problem. And, and okay, here's my personal rant, people. Settle back <laughs> a minute or two because I'm going to rant. Okay. <laughs> I've been doing the ICW for 22 years now. 22 years ago, we didn't have Dockwa, we didn't have Safe Harbor, we didn't have Oasis, we didn't have any of these corporations that were involving themselves in the marina business. Every marina was different, had different ownership, had different personalities, offered you different services, and it gave you a really neat flavor. Now everything's gone corporate. Places like Beaufort um, Municipal Marina, which is now Beaufort Safe Harbor Marina, uh, they don't offer a, a, a loaner car anymore because some lawyer said, Oh, well, that costs us money and it could be a liability. We could get sued for that. Well, piss on you. That's not what the boating lifestyle is supposed to be about. You know, but these people are in it for the um for the the return, the investors. Now, here's the other thing, and I've got this from from somebody who's in the know. The dock masters at these safe harbor locations are being told, cut down on the transients, fill the docks with long-term locals. So as a result, it's more and more difficult to get a slip going south because they want. Even though transient dockage pays considerably more than 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 long term dockage, local dockage, they want the guaranteed returns. They don't want to take the chance on earning, you know, a little extra money, but having to fuss with transients because we're a problem. I mean, we come in and we have to be docked, we have to be looked <laughs> at, we have to be talked to, and it's just it's really spoiling the experience. And and anyway, end of rant. Otherwise, I'll carry on for hours. <laughs> no, I totally I totally agree with you, but thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Um, Don't be afraid of you if, you if you're going to launch me in another rant. It's good. I think the last time that we were on, the, the, there were some discussions about um, certain groups leaving from different areas like Baltimore, Annapolis, et cetera. Is there a place to see where people are leaving from to go head south, or is it just a potluck? Oh, 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 oh. Um, the, um, I, I have a Facebook page called Facebook and sailing or fa sailing and cruising buddy boats. And if you go on there and then I was supposed to link to that and I didn't, and I apologize, but you know what? I can do that right here on my phone. Cool. Uh, and then I can read it. Okay. Um, buddy, let's see what it comes up with. Sailing, cruising buddy boats. Okay. Um, okay. It's called Facebook sailing and cruising buddy boats. Uh, and because it's my phone, I can't get the proper link. Um, anyway, if you go online to Facebook, go Facebook and sailing buddy boats, uh, the site will come up, si sign in there and indicate where you're at, where you're going, what kind of boat you have, and that you'd like to hook up with somebody to go buddy boating. Now, in addition to that, the Annapolis boat show, for example, um, you're going to meet lots of people there and there'll be an opportunity to hook up with people to travel South with. And as you are traveling, you'll you'll see the same people over and over again because, like I said, we tend to travel in clumps. So you got this group who's here on Monday, there on Tuesday. You got the group behind them that's Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, and you'll start making friends and, and find yourself traveling with people. So I know you're you're wondering about it, but it, it won't be a big issue. You'll find out that it works itself out very naturally. Thank you. Great. My pleasure. Susan, did you have a question or was that your husband talking? Oh, no, I was just, I think you actually had mentioned a, getting together to do some kind of, you know, dinner or something in Annapolis over Columbus yeah. Day. And and I apologize. I have not had a chance to do that. The storm basically knocked everything, um, knocked everything out of my head to deal with that dinner at Annapolis. I will arrange that in the next day or two. And by next Wednesday, I will have an answer for you. Thank you for reminding me. I apologize. Right. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm too busy for my own good. I'm uh, I'm hauling the boat in a few days time to, to repaint it and redo the bottom. So I'm, I'm also trying to organize parts and, and equipment and labor for that. <laughs> so 
But when you see the boat the next time, for those of you who've seen it before, it should be bright screaming red with gold with gold letter trim. That's the plan. <laughs> we hope. Anyhow, any other questions, folks? Doesn't sound like it, and I don't see anything on Messenger here. Uh, so if there are no other questions, um, I will sign off for tonight um, and start preparing next Wednesday's lecture, and I'll have an answer for you about the dinner and other things. Uh, as I said, this will be record. This has been recorded, and it will be available online a bit later tonight or tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Hello. you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Yeah. See you next week. Bye. Yeah.